Hi, I'm Dr. Larry Malerba, and welcome back to the All Things Homeopathy channel. Today I'll be talking about the homeopathic remedy Arsenicum album, which is Latin for white arsenic. Arsenic is an element on the periodic table with atomic number 33. More specifically, homeopathic arsenic is potentized from a compound called arsenic trioxide. Arsenicum album is a very important polycrest with broad applicability to a wide variety of both acute and chronic conditions. As always, I'll try my best to keep this discussion concise and to the point. So let's jump right in. Okay, so the overarching theme with arsenicum has to do with security and insecurity. Arsenicum is a fear-based remedy, and the two most prominent arsenicum fears are fear of illness and fear of poverty. In the mind of arsenicum, illness and poverty represent the two largest existential threats to his security. Most everything else in arsenicum's life relates back to these two concerns. And these potential threats to his well-being tend to make him a very anxious and restless person. Arsenicum is anxious, restless, and insecure about his personal safety. The worse he gets, the more he focuses on doing everything in his power to ensure his personal security. You may recall that stramonium is also a fear-based remedy, but the threat to stramonium is one of violence. Arsenicum fears illness and disease and financial ruin. To Arsenicum, the two most valued things in this material life are good health and financial security. To make matters worse, Arsenicum fears being alone. He fears being sick and alone, or poor and alone, with no one there to assist him or to help him in his hour of need. He fears being helpless, and ultimately, he fears death itself. Not surprisingly, then, he is risk-averse, and he tries to control the things that he believes will ensure his security. The more anxious he becomes, the more desperate and controlling he can be. He may focus on his own health and security to the point of being self-absorbed and even selfish. Arsenicum is anxious about the possibility of contracting all sorts of diseases. He is fearful of germs and contagion, and he also fears chronic disease and cancers. His biggest fear is that he will be incurable and that he is going to die. Nevertheless, he is the type who trusts medical authorities. He trusts his doctors, visits them frequently, and calls them frequently. Although his doctor may temporarily reassure him that his symptoms are not a sign of serious disease, it won't be long before he needs to be convinced all over again that there's nothing to worry about. Although Arsenicum's anxiety about health also seems to apply to the people, people around him, don't let that fool you. In most cases, this is his own fear about himself that he transfers to those upon whom he is dependent for his safety and well-being. In other words, he thinks of to himself, what's going to happen to me if my loved one dies? I'll be left all alone. One way to find out is to simply ask a direct question. When my patient expresses anxiety about the potential loss of her husband, for example, I simply ask whether she's more upset about the prospect of having to grieve his loss or whether she's more worried about how she'll survive alone without him. You'd be surprised how honest people can be if you have the courage to be upfront and straight with them. Now, although Arsenicum does not like to be alone, he may give the impression to others that he's independent and self-sufficient. He doesn't like to admit to his dependency upon others for his sense of security. He doesn't want company in the sense that Pulsatilla wants someone to comfort and console her. He's not particularly touchy-feely or affectionate. He can be rather prickly indeed. In fact, he may be aggravated by this kind of emotional attention. 
He may not even want to be touched due to his desire to avoid germs and contamination. But what he does want is to know that someone will be there if he needs their help, if he becomes sick or needs their assistance. He desires company because he needs to be reassured that he will be safe from illness and destitution. Of course, the flip side of his desire for company is that arsenicum can be worse or aggravated when alone, especially when he's sick or feeling under the weather. Arsenicum can be found in repertories under fear of being alone lest he die. In addition, the anxiety of arsenicum is often accompanied by restlessness he can be restless mentally and or physically. And the restlessness and anxiety both tend to be worse at night, especially around or after midnight. He may toss about in bed, unable to settle his anxious mind. Arsenicum lists under restless anxiousness driving him out of bed. Even during a debilitating illness, and in spite of feeling weakness and fatigue, arsenicum can still be restless. Another well-known characteristic of arsenicum is fastidiousness. He is notoriously perfectionistic about his appearance. Arsenicum tends to be very well-dressed, oftentimes wearing clothing and jewelry that are more formal than the occasion demands. He is proper and conservative. His appearance is cleanly, tidy, and orderly, as are his surroundings and his living space. His cleanliness and need for order can be compulsive. A word that characterizes the arsenicum type perfectly is persnickety. The definition of persnickety is one who is too particular or precise, fussy, fastidious, giving too much attention to small details that are not important in a way that annoys other people, snobbish, showing or requiring extremely careful treatment. I usually try to avoid stereotyping remedies by comparing them to celebrities, but in this case I'll make an exception. Felix Unger of the Odd Couple TV sitcom is a near perfect representation of arsenicum. Maybe too much so, because after all, the character of Felix is exaggerated for comedic effect. And I don't mean the Felix played by Jack Lemmon in the Odd Couple movie. I mean the one played by Tony Randall in the old TV series. That Felix personifies persnickety to perfection. Of course, the obvious underlying motivation for arsenicum's persnickiness is control. It's an anxious attempt to maintain a sense of security. It's designed to ward off the unknown, to keep illness away, and to keep germs at bay. It's a vain attempt to create order in a chaotic and unpredictable world. Nevertheless, it doesn't stop arsenicum from trying for example, to eat a pristine diet. After all, he thinks to himself, I won't get sick if I wash my hands and eat only healthy foods. Of course, while a healthy diet is always a positive thing, we all know that this kind of control is just an illusion. Taken too far, extreme dietary regimentation can sometimes result in other issues like anorexia, and arsenicum happens to be one of the remedies indicated for anorexia. The arsenicum type has been known to bring a detailed list of symptoms to each medical consultation. This can be especially true of the homeopathic consultation because homeopaths make it their business to pay close attention to details, and the arsenicum type will quickly tune into this fact. However, it shouldn't be hard for an observant practitioner to conclude that arsenicum's anxiety about his symptoms is sometimes more problematic than the actual symptoms themselves. Now, the other big arsenicum fear is fear of poverty. Arsenicum lists and repertories under avarice, 
which is just another word for greed. Again, it's not so much that he wishes to be rich as much as he equates money and possessions with personal security. This desire for material security can sometimes translate into stinginess. And don't let him fool you. His stingy nature may cause him to downplay the benefits that he may have experienced from his homeopathic prescription. Arsenicum's miserly, penny-pinching way draws comparisons to the mythical Scrooge himself. This combination of fear of illness and fear of poverty can make Arsenicum rather uptight, irritable, and demanding. His worried and stingy nature can make him disagreeable and fussy, especially to those upon whom he relies for his sense of security. He can be critical and fault-finding, while at the same time clingy and solicitous. Arsenicum lists prominently under the rubrics censorious and reproaches others. Now, just to be thorough, let's list the Arsenicum fears once more. There's fear of illness and disease, fear of germs and contagion, fear of incurable disease, and fear of cancer. And there's fear of death. All of these fears are compounded by Arsenicum's fear of being alone. Sometimes we see fear of vomiting, which encompasses both fear of illness and the insecurity of losing bodily control. In addition, we see fear of poverty. And lastly, arsenicum is one of the main remedies listed for fear of robbers, which reflects both a feeling of insecurity and a fear of poverty. Before we move on to the generals and physicals, allow me to say a word about arsenicum in the later stages of illness. First of all, arsenicum is commonly indicated in late stage disease. When a person becomes naturally concerned and anxious about the eventual outcome of his condition. In such cases, the anxiety may become too great to bear. And this is when arsenicum can become despairing about his prospects for recovery. Arsenicum lists under despair of recovery and despair with fear of death. It also lists under delusion that he cannot be helped. Strangely, arsenicum can also feel suicidal in later stages of illness. It lists under suicidal disposition from despair and paradoxically, suicidal disposition with fear of death. All right, now let's talk about the arsenicum generals and modalities. Okay, so in terms of generals, arsenicum is notoriously chilly. There can be great chilliness and a great need for warmth. She is very cold and is aggravated by cold but is ameliorated by heat. Interestingly, another big arsenicum general is burning. There are burning pains and burning sensations that manifest just about anywhere, and that can be felt in a wide range of conditions. And paradoxically, the burning pains are made better from heat. So when we see burning pains that are ameliorated by warmth, or hot applications, or even hot drinks, we think of arsenicum. Furthermore, the arsenicum type may complain of feeling generally chilly, but may also complain of internal burning. So we can see internal burning with external chilliness. In terms of food and drink preferences, arsenicum is famous for its tendency to take frequent small sips of drinks. Most often she prefers warm or hot drinks, but she can also sip on cold drinks too. This tendency to sip drinks often becomes more pronounced with acute illnesses, like during a flu or fever. But overall, there is a general preference for warm drinks like tea or coffee, and warm foods. And there may be an aversion to cold drinks or cold food. 
In terms of food tastes, there isn't a lot that stands out, except perhaps sometimes as a preference for sour things. Arsenica may like lemon in her, her hot tea, for example, or vinegar-based dressings on her salads and food. And some will express a preference for fats or oils, like olive oil. But what I have seen quite often is a strong preoccupation with a variety of health-related dietary measures. Arsenicum doesn't eat for taste or enjoyment. She eats for health, and she's quite particular about her choices. I've tried to pin suspected arsenicum patients down on what it is that they like to eat, and I tend to get answers like, well, for breakfast, I eat whole grain oats with almond milk, and I add organic dates, sunflower seeds, and a little bit of flaxseed oil. The take-home message here is that arsenicum is very fussy and finicky about what she chooses to eat. As you can imagine, with eating habits like this, most arsenicum types tend to be rather thin in build. Although not a prominent feature, arsenicum symptoms and ailments can sometimes be more right-sided. So for example, there may be a right-sided sore throat that is better from warm drinks and worse from cold drinks. As you can see, not only does arsenicum tend to avoid cold drinks and food, but they can aggravate her symptoms too. Arsenicum symptoms also tend to manifest with striking periodicity and the most common manifestation of this periodicity is an aggravation at or around or soon after midnight. There's a general aggravation of symptoms, especially between midnight and 2 a.m. This is when, for example, asthma may flare up or when the vomiting or diarrhea that comes with a viral illness may hit. Of course, this is also when arsenicum's anxiety and restlessness intensifies. Think of anxiety, restlessness, and a fear of being alone as common concomitants associated with arsenicum symptoms. Arsenicum also lists prominently in repertories under aggravation of symptoms every four days, every two weeks, and every 28 days. But the most important arsenicum modalities by far are aggravation between midnight and 2 a.m., aggravation from cold, aggravation from being alone, and amelioration from warmth, and amelioration from company. All right, now let's talk about some of arsenicum's physical health problems. Now, as you might expect, many of arsenicum's physical conditions are aggravated and ameliorated by the aforementioned factors, and they are often associated with burning pains or burning sensations, and they tend to be accompanied by anxiety and restlessness. Arsenicum has a well-known tendency to develop gastrointestinal symptoms, so we can almost predict that the arsenicum stomach pain will be a kind of burning pain, and that it will feel worse from cold liquids and better from warm drinks. The same applies to esophageal irritation or to stomach ulcers or to the arsenicum version of colitis. There can be burning anywhere along the GI tract, and it tends to be worse from cold and better from warmth. Even burning hemorrhoids are ameliorated by warmth. Now, there's one additional unusual clue in arsenicum GI complaints, and that is that milk can aggravate the stomach or esophageal pain, but more commonly, it actually ameliorates the pain. So when we see a person who drinks milk to cope with his stomach ulcer, we think of arsenicum. Of course, the most famous arsenicum GI symptoms of all are diarrhea and vomiting. These symptoms can occur separately or together with each other. When a patient complains about either vomiting or diarrhea, I always ask about when it began and when it flares up. 
if the answer is that it began after waking at midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., then I always consider arsenicum. Furthermore, arsenicum's diarrhea and or vomiting tend to be worse from cold drinks, worse after eating ice cream, and worse from fruit. We see a similar pattern with arsenicum respiratory symptoms. In hay fever, for example, the eyes can burn and the nose can be alternatingly stuffed up or runny. The arsenicum conjunctivitis is often associated with burning pain, and the asthma has a tendency to flare up between midnight and 2 a.m. The same applies to any kind of arsenicum cough, including pneumonia. It's worse between midnight and 2 a.m., and as we would expect, it can be aggravated by cold drinks and made worse from cold air. In addition, the arsenicum asthma and cough both tend to be worse when lying and better while sitting up. And it should come as no surprise that if arsenicum complains of insomnia, it tends to be at its worst between midnight and 2 or 3 a.m. In terms of skin and mucous membranes, arsenicum symptoms tend to be burning, excoriating, and ulcer forming. Arsenicum is prone toward mouth ulcers, otherwise known in the books as aphthous ulcers. Discharges are often acrid, offensive, and excoriating. The tongue can be coated white. Arsenicum can also be a remedy for eczema, herpes, and psoriasis. And it's one of the main remedies for itching skin without any eruption. Like sulfur, it's also indicated when we see a combination of itching and burning. As previously noted, arsenicum is indicated for a wide variety of acute conditions, and in such cases, the generals guide us to the remedy, whether it's a case of the flu, a viral fever, food poisoning, a cough, or diarrhea. We tend to see the same pattern of anxiety, restlessness, thirst for small sips, aggravation at midnight or thereafter, general chilliness, aggravation from cold, aggravation from being alone, and a desire for warmth and company. I successfully treated a good number of arsenicum cases in the early months of the COVID epidemic. The indications were clear and recovery was usually very quick. I guess it was a bit of a double-edged sword because these patients were contented to stay at home in isolation in order to avoid germ exposure, but on the other hand, some of them weren't very happy about being separated from their families. And finally, arsenicum is one of the main remedies indicated for late-stage illness. It fits broken down constitutions in cases of advanced disease. We frequently find great prostration and exhaustion accompanied by the keynote anxious restlessness. It's a remedy for cancer and malignancies, and it's even indicated in cases of gangrene. Okay, now let's finish up with remedy relationships. Complements to arsenicum include phosphorus, sulfur, thuya, nat sulf, carbo veg, and lachesis. It's worth comparing arsenicum to aconite because of its anxiety, restlessness, and fear of death. Phosphorus is also anxious, desires company, and has burning pains. It too is thirsty, but the phosphorus thirst is for large quantities. Nitric acid has a great deal of anxiety about health and can also be clingy and desperate. Veratrum album is similar in that it too fits acute illnesses with simultaneous vomiting and diarrhea. It's also very chilly and can have a desire for sour things. 
Hepar sulf is another remedy for acute conditions that are better from warmth and worse from cold, and it too, like sour things. Rustox can also be chilly and anxious. However, the famous rust restlessness is more often associated with physical pain and discomfort. Argentum nitricum is another very anxious remedy with similar fears, including fear of illness, fear of death, and a desire for company. And lastly, don't overlook the possibility of arsenicum iodatum, especially in cases that look like arsenicum, but are agitated, hyperactive, and warm-blooded. Okay, that's my take on our Seneca album. I hope you found it helpful. Thanks, as always, for watching. Your comments, questions, and feedback are always appreciated. Please do subscribe, and I'll see you again at the next installment of All Things Homeopathy. May the vital force be with you.